Singing number 231. Faith is the victory. <clears throat> 231. <clears throat> Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on or every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. That overcomes the world. <clears throat> Number 395. 395. Let's sing one, two, and four. Beulah Land. <clears throat> 395. <clears throat> I'll reach the land of corn and wine, and all its riches freely mine. There shines and in one blissful day, for all my night will pass away. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me. And view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. The Savior comes and walks with me, and sweet communion here at we. He gently leads me by the hand, for this is heaven's borderland. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. Zephyr seem to float to me, sweet sounds of heaven's melody, as angels with the white robe throng join in the sweet redemption song. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore my have my home forevermore. Carl, would you lead us a word of prayer, please? 
Dearly Father, we thank you for this day and the many blessings you give us. We're so thankful to be able to be here this evening, sing songs of praise to you, and to study from your word. We just ask that you be with those of our number that are sick. And we just ask that you comfort them and heal them to be your will. And also pray for those who may be traveling and ask for their safe travels. We ask this time that you help us listen closely to the, your message and may we be able to leave here to follow your work more closely. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Sure good to see everyone out tonight. It's been a bit of an emotionally draining couple of days at our house. And uh, it's nice just to get together with people and do some singing and see each other and just uh, find comfort in the presence of our fellow brethren. So glad to see everyone out tonight. Tonight's lesson is going to be uh, talking about Jacob's dream. It's found in Genesis chapter 28, and then we'll also take a look at a passage in the book of John that uh, seems to tie in with this dream. But uh, as we always do every week, I, I like to go back and just think about the previous lesson because uh, just hoping that each lesson we're building a little bit upon the previous one. And of course, our lesson last week had to do with Jacob deceiving his father Isaac. His mother Rebecca schemed together with Jacob to receive Isaac's blessing instead of his older brother Esau. And as we talked about last week, when Jacob presents himself as Esau to Isaac. Isaac is a little skeptical at first. He hears the voice of his son Jacob, but when he feels his arm and he smells his clothes and he tastes that food, Jacob is, pardon me, Isaac is convinced that this is in fact Esau when it's not, it's Jacob. Esau comes along and what he learns is that that lack of respect he showed toward his birthright by selling it to his younger brother Jacob a few chapters earlier came back to haunt him. And, and I do believe that this is a, an example of, of sowing and reaping, that the, the, the disrespect that he showed toward his birthright ends up coming back to uh, haunt him. The consequences... Are, uh, are very difficult for him to accept. Of course, he's very angry with his brother Jacob and Rebecca being Jacob's mother, of course. She's also the mother of, of Esau, but she loves Jacob more. She manipulates Isaac at the end of the chapter to send Jacob off to be with her brother uh, Laban up in Haran. And that's kind of where we left off at the end of last week's lesson. So... Uh, Quite a sordid little tale with, uh, you know, a lot of family dysfunction, rivalry, favoritism, manipulation, lying. Uh, it's kind of like a soap opera, <laughs> you know. Uh, but what we're really seeing in these Old Testament stories is we're seeing human nature and the way human nature operates. So for all of the, the admirable qualities that we see in some of these folks, we can also see definite flaws, sins, and, uh, and qualities that are difficult to admire. Anything else about last week's story? Anything you want to bring up? Questions lingering? Are we good to move on to the next lesson? Okay, let's move on to Jacob's dream, lesson 16. And uh, let's just read the first five verses of chapter 28. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you 
and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Paddan Aram and to Laban the son of Bethuel the Syrian the brother of Rebekah the mother of Jacob and Esau. All right, so Jacob is off to Haran. And we recall from last week's lesson that Esau had made some poor choices in his first wives. He took them from the Hittites, and they were a grief of mind to both Isaac and Rebekah. Of course, Esau wants to kill Jacob. And I bring up the, those wives because that's sort of Rebecca's grounds for convincing Isaac that Jacob needs to go, right? She says to him, I, I just won't be able to live with Jacob marrying women from this region. So let's send him back to my family so that he can find a more appropriate wife. So Jacob is sent off because on the grounds, according to Rebecca, he'll find a better wife from among her people and, of course, because Esau wants to kill Jacob. So Rebekah, in all this, wants to protect Jacob from Esau. So she, as I mentioned a moment ago, manipulates Isaac. I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like those who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? So there's some serious manipulation going on here in my estimation. Now... It is true that they were a grief to Isaac and Rebekah, but this, this just seems to me like uh, it's not entirely honest. What Rebekah really wants is to protect Jacob from Esau. That's her real motivation in all of this. <coughs> now, as we read those first five verses of uh, Genesis 28, it's good to remember that in this section, there's really two blessings that are happening. Isaac has already blessed Jacob with his own blessing back in chapter 27. And that's the blessing that Jacob received when he deceived his father. So that's back in chapter 27, verses 27 through 29. That's the first blessing. But in these first five verses of chapter 28, it's now Isaac's wish that Jacob receive the blessing that God gave to Abraham. He says, may God Almighty bless you, and I skip a little bit there, may I give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So, pardon me, God gave Abraham this blessing, promising that his descendants would inherit the land. He reiterates that blessing to Isaac. This is something we did not read, but back in Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 through 5, the same promise that God gave to Abraham, he gives to Isaac. Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land of which I shall tell you, dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Abraham received the promise, he received this blessing. It's reiterated to Isaac, and now Isaac, it is his wish that God would give that same blessing to Jacob. So he's wanting this blessing to be passed on to his son, Jacob. All right, so that's really the thing that connects these three men together, other than the fact that their father and son is, is this reiteration of this blessing. And this comes back when we get into the book of Exodus. So a couple hundred years later, while the children of Israel are enslaved in Egypt, here's what... Moses says in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now it happened in the process of time 
that the king of Egypt died, then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. What is that covenant? Well, it's that same covenant we read back in Genesis 26, the covenant that God had given to Abraham, he gives it again to Isaac. This is what Isaac wants for his son, Jacob. So that's the, the blessings at work here. Yeah, Chad, go ahead. So here Isaac is obviously willingly giving the blessing of Abraham to Jacob, whereas the first blessing he was tricked into it. Yeah. Is this one being done willingly because he's standing, he knows at this point he was tricked, but he's standing by that because he did bless um, Jacob, and so now, okay, Jacob was blessed, so he follows through this time. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what his motivations are. What, what I think is interesting is Isaac doesn't have the power or the authority to give this blessing. It's more of a, a wish or a desire that God would go ahead and bless Jacob with this. Uh, so I don't think, at least from my vantage point, it doesn't seem to me like Isaac... Isaac can't pass this along because that's above his pay grade. This is something that God has to be stuck. He's only telling Jacob, I hope God gives this to you. That's the way I take it at least. But uh, I don't know what motivated him to wish that. Um, there's just not enough information. And I, I thought about that, and I, I just couldn't come up with a good reason. And maybe it's just as simple as... Isaac knew the prophecy that had been made about these two children when they were in the womb of Rebekah. He saw how all of this had come to pass, and perhaps he's just putting two and two together, that, that Jacob is going to be the chosen son, and Esau will not. I, I don't know. That's my best guess. I, I can't really think of any other reason why. Anybody else have a question or call? Yeah, go ahead, Darrell. That, that's kind of what I was saying. I guess it's kind of both what Chad's saying and you're saying. But, uh, Jacob had the birthright. Jacob had the blessing. And he, they had what you just said, had the prophecy. And, and he would want his son that had those things to be the one that would carry that out. Yeah. I mean, like you say, he didn't really have the power. But he, that would be what he would want. I mean, that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, and, and it could be, and it could be that Isaac was having a moment of a prophesying as well, where perhaps he is is speaking, uh, forth, foretelling what is about to take place. That's possible as well. Yeah, it just it kind of seems like maybe he was reading <laughs> to borrow. <laughs> Tomorrow, saying from another Bible story, he was seeing the writing on the wall <laughs> and kind of putting it all together and just maybe concluding that this is the direction things are headed. Any other? Yeah, go ahead, Darrell. This is this is kind of parallel or off subject just a little bit, but mm -hmm. just it, 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 we have the promised land is king. Yes. Where is the promised land today? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, it's not here on earth, as far as I can tell. It it would be eternal. It'd be in, it'd be heaven. But as physically, we understand then, it. where mm -hmm. is it physically today? That was physically then. Where is it physically today? Uh -huh. Where is the promised land? Uh -huh. uh, land of Canaan. Um, well, it, it would be the the hereditary home of the Jewish people, right? Okay. It'd be the land of Israel. Okay. Is that what you're after? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So when was the prophecy, when was, help me out with the time frame when mm -hmm. this was written. Okay. And it just kind of, because we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh -huh. We're talking about them coming out of Egypt. We're talking about all of that. Kind of give me just a little time of when these things were written. Okay. When they were written or when they took place? Kind of both. Okay. <laughs> And the, right. I'm, and the reason I'm asking is, yeah. I believe that these things, this, this isn't some story that the Hebrews, the Jewish people made up years later mm -hmm. and recorded. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's my belief, that this was 
foretold, it was prophesied, it was God's will. Okay. So all these dates are going to be BC. Okay. okay. So Abraham, we're going to call him living roughly in the 1800s. Try, try another one. That's oh, is that not uh, where not It's not visible. Okay. Please. Yeah. No Let me test this before I try. Ah. Try this. How's that? There. Yes. Thank you. Okay. We're just going to call him Abe. Okay. Okay. And. We know that 400 to 430 years after Abraham, the children of Israel were taken out of the land of Egypt. That puts us in the 1400s. Okay? And uh, Moses is going to die. Doing this off the top of my head. So, I apologize. You know, that's a little bit dangerous. You know, Moses is going to die around 1400. Close. Okay? <clears throat> and and I, I just will mention this just for sake of clarity. Now, if you look in a, uh, an archaeological study Bible or maybe in the notes of your Bible, you might notice that there is some dispute as to when the Exodus happened. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a fairly robust debate about did the children of Israel invade Canaan in the 1200s or in the 1400s? And that's a whole study in and of itself. But I'm going to stick with this date. I've got my reasons for going with that date. So if Abraham lived in the 1800s, if the Exodus happened in the 1400s, and if we say just roughly that Moses died in 1400, at which time the law was complete, these things were spoken almost 2,000 years before Jesus appeared on the earth. And these things were written down 1,400 years before Jesus appeared on earth. Does that answer your question, Darrell? Yes. Okay. Did you have any follow-ups? Okay. All right. Does that get it? Any questions? Yeah, Jordan, go ahead. So he was asking about physical location. Now, yes. Tell me if I'm wrong. When they, when they left Egypt, they yep. went east past the sea. Yep. Uh -huh. And they kept going east, and somewhere which would be the Middle East today is where they spent a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, Mount Mount Sinai is that what you're referring to? Or this um, that region? In, in that area. Yes. Yeah. So the, the in the Old Testament the Promised Land, the physical land was in that area. Yeah. And, and is that the reason why today? There's a lot of disputes in the Middle East. Uh, so it's like two different things. Well, <laughs> the reason why there's disputes in the Middle East, that's a really complicated question. But uh, um, here, here's what I can say. Um, you might remember um, back in um, the 15th chapter of Genesis, we actually took a look at this. Let's go ahead and open. I'm going to go ahead and open that up real quick so I make sure I've got the verses correct here. So Genesis chapter 15, God actually uh, states the parameters of the promised land to Abram. So this is in verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. Now, uh, that also may say the river of Egypt in some of your translations. Um, Basically, if you want to think of it roughly, from where the, of course, there, there wasn't a, uh, there, the Suez Canal didn't exist until the 1800s, right? But if you kind of imagine where the Suez Canal is right now, just kind of use that as a rough geographic point in your mind. Basic, basically, God's saying the promised land will stretch from that, approximately that area, stretch all the way up that coastline up into the River Euphrates. That's the... Uh, up to the river Euphrates, which would be up toward the uh, uh, northeast 
right? Mm -hmm. So that, that section there along the coast all the way up to the Euphrates. Now, the children of Israel uh, only controlled that territory for a very short period of time during the reign of Solomon, if my memory serves me correct. So usually when you look in the back, in the back of your Bible at a map of the quote-unquote Holy Land, it's going to be quite a bit smaller. It's, it's going to stop, uh, in the south, it's going to stop well before you get down to where the Suez Canal is currently. And in the north, it's going to stop well short of the Euphrates River. So that, that's the promised land. It's, it's the parameters that God gave Abram in Genesis 15, 18. That answer your question, Jordan? It does. Okay. Now, as to why there are disputes in the Middle East. Uh, this goes back largely to uh, the disagreement between uh, the followers of Muhammad, uh, the Muslims, their belief that Ishmael was the chosen son of Abraham rather than Isaac. And that is the dispute. Mm -hmm. they, they, they trace their heritage back to Abraham, but through Ishmael and not through Isaac. And then within Islam itself, there are, there's a major division between Sunni and Shia. And that creates conflicts between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states. Iran is Shia. Um, those other Gulf states are Sunni. And it's why the ambassador from Saudi Arabia encouraged the Obama administration to cut off the head of the snake back during that time, he wanted us to attack Iran and basically take them off of the board politically, which is not what our policy ended up being during that administration. Anyways, so that's just kind of a little flavor of two of the main reasons why there's so much conflict in that region of the world. And there's oil. So, you know, then there's that too. So, that's the reason yeah. I wanted to have that time frame yeah. for that reason, yeah. so we can kind of understand, because we're studying mm -hmm. the 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 anger, the betrayal, the all the things that led up to all this, or not all of it, yeah. but a lot of this animosity and this hate yeah. In, yeah. The, in that region. And just to be clear, so Jesus was born probably 4 BC, okay? He died probably around 3080. Muhammad doesn't start having his visions in 610, until 610 uh, AD. I'm sorry to say it wrong here, but uh, anyways. Uh, so he doesn't start having his visions until that point. He doesn't begin preach, preaching until 612. And uh, he holds Jesus to be a prophet, a predecessor of his, but that he, he claims for himself to be the final prophet from God. So um, anyways, that, that's a fairly late development here compared to the, the history that's here. That's why when you're doing archaeology in this region, you find a lot of Jewish artifacts from 600, 700, 800, 900 BC because they were living in the land at that time. They had a, a kingdom in the land at that time. So, good questions. Really good stuff. Jordan, go ahead. Well, I, I don't want to take up your whole class. Well, that's all right. This class is for you all. So, yeah. So, everything you said was made sense. It was very good. Okay. So one more question. Yeah. From a Jewish perspective, uh -huh. they would Right. Torah. Mm -hmm. Do they reference Genesis 15 as, as far as they think they still yeah. have that land today? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it would depend. It, <sighs> the, the Jewish community uh, is uh, as divided up religiously. I, I shouldn't say that. It's not as divided up religiously as, as Protestantism, but there's a lot of division within the Jewish community as far as religion goes. And there's actually a substantial portion of the Jewish community that's 
that are atheists. They don't even believe in God. They just simply believe in holding their culture intact and they celebrate the holidays in order to maintain their culture as a people. But if you would talk to the more orthodox Jews, uh, the Hasidic Jews, the more orthodox um, Ben Shapiro, who's a popular conservative commentator, he's an orthodox Jew. I, I think they would, uh, they would say, yes, we believe that God gave us uh, the right to claim that land in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. War started like last fall. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people online, especially, were debating Old Testament scriptures and going back and forth on whether or not what means what. So I think this conversation through Genesis is, is relevant to some of the current events going on. Yeah. Can you can you cite any specific examples of? And I'm sorry to put you on the spot here, but it might be helpful if we had an, an one example maybe of what you're mentioning. Just 15, I saw someone like ask me if my recollection is good. Like, you know, uh, I think the word is created in millennial, millennialism. Where oh, okay. So I've heard some of those thoughts. Right. Yeah, because what's happening in the in the American evangelical community is is this belief that. Uh, that the kingdom of Israel is going to be restored at some point before the return of Jesus. Um, I don't understand that doctrine because it's uh, a little difficult to wrap your arms around and everybody's kind of got their own little variations on, on uh, what they think revelation means. But I do know within premillennialism, there is a belief that the nation of Israel will become... Uh, uh, that that I think there is an anticipation of a mass conversion of the Jews to Jesus Christ, and uh, yeah, that's probably all I should say because I'm I'm sp speaking a little bit off the cuff here, and I don't want to I don't want to mischaracterize what other people interpret or believe there. So yeah, I think your early on comment was spot on. Promised land is not a physical place here on earth. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We need to remember that. Yeah. And that that is all changed. But I I want the historical perspective right. for us to understand what's mm -hmm. going on today. Was there I asked my question? I'm not. You know. Yeah. We're we're looking for another home. It's not over there. Yeah. And and the the trouble is, um, I you know I remember. Uh, Back in November or thereabouts, I remember texting my sister and saying, you know, I'm thinking about putting a lesson together on the Palestinian Jewish conflict. And she said <laughs> she she thought that might be a bit much. And she was probably right. I was having one of those, you know, one of those moments like the things that interest you don't interest other people. <laughs> but uh yeah, it, it it is confusing. Because people continue to ref to refer to it as the Holy Land. Well, exactly. I mean, that that as far as I can tell has passed away with the death of Jesus Christ. That Jesus brought those things to a conclusion. So, I've always found yeah. it interesting that the the children of Israel were scattered mm -hmm. throughout history. Yeah, and, and prior to 1948, when the conquering parts of the world said, yeah. we're going to give you this land. Yeah. And they were in Russia. They were everywhere. Yeah. They were six million killed by the Germans. <coughs> and the persecution that occurred to the, that nation. And all that remains today is man saying, this, we're putting you back there. Yeah. This is where we're going to put you. And then we know the history of the wars with Egypt and everything else since then. So, yeah. But the, the, the state of Israel, as we know it today, is young. Yeah. But it's a reaction to the world leaders saying, we're not going to, I mean, they're still scattered everywhere. Yeah. But that is, that. I mean, we see Jews going back today to fight mm -hmm. from all over the world, mm -hmm. citizenship from all over the world. Yeah. Because they consider that homeland. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, you know, one thing that we're not always aware of, of course, we're all familiar with the Holocaust, but in reality, the Jews had been enduring uh, persecution in Europe for centuries at that point. Anti-Semitism uh, was something that the Catholic Church stoked in the Middle Ages, for example, and uh, the Jews were just treated horribly. So there was a, yeah, <laughs> there was an effort to, to, to maybe just kind of get them out so that they could have their own nation because of what they had suffered, this terrible atrocity. But there was also some anti-Semitism behind that as well. Let, let's, you know, let, we, we can laud <laughs> Western countries for what they did, but quite frankly, they didn't really want them around anyways. So, um, you know, Germany just did what all the rest of them had been doing previously, just not at that kind of scale is what I'm saying. So, um, anyways, all right, great questions. That was, uh, that was a, a good uh, few rabbits to chase. Let's, um, let's get back into the text here. Um, so Esau uh, regrets, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I think he's a little jealous of Jacob. He's been sent on his way with the blessing from his parents. So he decides, well, since these wives are causing my parents grief, I'm just going to go marry a gal from the daughters of Ishmael. So uh, that's what he does there in that section. Esau marries again. And it does look to me like this is probably Esau's way of maybe getting back into the good graces, so to speak. You know, he's lost the, the blessing from his father. He knows that his uh, Hittite wives are a grief to his mother and father. And he takes a wife from Ishmael, right? He takes a wife from the daughters of Ishmael, which is sort of his way of maybe let's keep things in the family, so to speak. And I... I I couldn't help but think as I was going back through this of that verse that we read at the end of the study last week from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. It just seems to me like this is more of, of Esau's regret. Like he's, he's trying to fix things, you know, and it's too late. The, uh, the horse is out of the barn. Right? As they say. So let's talk about this dream. I definitely want to cover this because this is the most uh, crucial part of the entire chapter. It says Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 15. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he laid down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to the heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So Isaac's wish for Jacob came true. God does pass on this blessing, this covenant, this promise to Jacob. This is the same God that made the promise to Abraham and Isaac. He identifies himself as such. In that blessing, he promises the land will go to the descendants of Jacob. It also mentions that, or God also mentions that his descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth, right? Kind of like as numerous as the sand of the sea or as numerous as the stars in the heavens. Same sort of comparisons. And through Jacob and through his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
So this is the exact same promise God made to Abraham and Isaac. He's now making it to Jacob. But God does put a little tag on the end of this. He promises to return Jacob safely intact back to this land. Now, what I think is really interesting about this, this timing, remember, God first gave this covenant to Abram after he left his family behind. And isn't it interesting, you have an echo here, that same sort of idea. Like Abram, Jacob received the blessing after he left his family behind. So just a little interesting little recapitulation, right? Uh, we, we sometimes say history repeats itself, but a better way of thinking about it is history rhymes. If you think more of like a, a poem, for example, poetry you often have, uh, syllables that rhyme at the end, and that's the way history works. It's not an exact copy, but it, it tends to have the same theme, uh, the same things happening over and over, just maybe played around with a little bit, maybe re, uh, rearranged might be the best way to put it. Now, with apologies to Led Zeppelin, I, I just want to point out, I think I pointed this out in your study guide, Jacob saw a ladder going to heaven, but it was actually, actually that word is better translated, a stairway to heaven. And uh, I, I ran across this suggestion in, in one of my um, uh, reference books, and I think that there may be something to this. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were studying the Tower of Babel. We, we took a look at several different structures like this. Whoops. Yeah, let me pull this up here real quick. So this is the, uh, uh, the ziggurat down in Ur. And we notice there are these stairways going up. And the idea behind these temples were that you ascended these, these stairways and then up at the top, you would have the presence of God, right? And, and we see this idea, again, the whole idea of rhymes happening all over the world. Um, let me pull up my notes here real quick. Um, so this is the, uh, oops, try this. Yeah, okay. That's the great ziggurat at Ur. This is the pyramid at the Suku Temple in Indonesia. Same sort of idea. Notice you've got the stairway going up and then the idea is the presence of the God is at the top, okay? You've got the temple of uh, Kukul Khan. Did you ever go to this? Have you ever I, been to El Castillo? I have personally walked the stairs to the top of Oh, the I wondered if you'd been there before, You're Chad. You're no allowed to do that, but when I was there, you could still walk. Up. Yeah, so this is in the Mayan city of Chich, uh, Chichen Itza, right? Chichen Itza. Same sort of idea. Yep, you can walk those stairs, and what's up here at the top? The presence of the Mayan god. A really pretty view. I bet it is. But yep. those stairs are about this tall each and about this wide each. Very interesting. It's kind of almost like a ladder then. And you go yeah. down. And I'm not afraid of heights. I'm also not super coordinated, but I'm not afraid of heights. <laughs> Very nice up there. Beautiful view of the jungle because that's Chichen Itza is now in the middle of the jungle. Uh -huh. Turned around to come back down. I had to turn around and crawl down backwards. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I could not go down and face first. Absolutely. And you can get a sense of the scale because you got people standing down here at the bottom, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl said he'd be the helicopter. Here's some pyramids, some step pyramids at the Canary Islands. Same sort of idea, right? You, you go up the steps and the, and the presence of God is up at the top. Uh, this is at Prasat Prang in Koh Kare, Cambodia. It's not far from um, uh, oh, uh, Angkor Wat, right? So again, same sort of architecture. You've got the stairway going up to the presence of God. And that's, I, I think, because of the region of the world that Jacob was in, because you've got these ziggurats, these pyramids being built all over the place in this region, I, I think that that might be what this vision actually is. You've got a stairway going up to the presence of God. He sees the presence of God up at the top, and angels are ascending and descending uh, those stairs. There's one more. This is in Peru. So you find this all over the world. So I, I just have to wonder if that's not actually something akin to what he saw. 
And we talked about how those pyramids are basically like mountains, right? And there's this, this very deep spiritual connection between going to the top of a mountain, getting closer to the presence of God. And, you know, people would just, well, we'll just build our own mountain here that we can climb and our priests can get closer to God. Same sort of idea, at least from my point of view. All right, so let's get into this last section. We're running close on time. Always seems I have to say that in these, that's like almost like an obligatory statement in these studies. Um, Genesis 28, 16 through 22. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in the way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be my God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So he renames this place Bethel. Bethel, of course, means the house of God. And this is the same area where his grandfather Abraham built an altar. Abraham built an altar in this area and begins calling on the name of the Lord. Jacob builds a memorial using a stone. Now, unfortunately, Bethel becomes a place of idolatry during the reign of Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, after the kingdom split following the death of Solomon. And we'll get into all of that many moons from now. <laughs> Long time from now. But anyways, this, this actually becomes a place where Jeroboam sets up a, a house of idolatry. He puts a golden calf here at Bethel. He puts a second golden calf up in the city of Dan in the north. And he tells the northern kingdom of Israel, you don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship. You can go worship your God either at Bethel or at Dan. You don't need to go back to Jerusalem to the temple. So Bethel becomes corrupted by the idolatrous practice, practices of the children of Israel. Now, what's interesting is if you remember back to the blessing, remember God put that little tag at the end of the promise. He said, I will return you to this land one day. Jacob, when he awakens from the dream, says, God, if you will bring me back here in peace, you will be my God. So you have a covenant of sorts that's being formed. God promised to return Jacob and Jacob promised to be faithful to God if God kept his promise. And Jacob also goes on to pledge a tithe if he returns home in peace. And again, there's a bit of an echo, a bit of a rhyme here with Abraham. Remember Abraham? I, we didn't cover this story, so I'll, I'll just kind of go through this real quickly. Abraham and Lot, his nephew, they split. They go their separate directions. Lot settles down close to Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham goes the opposite way. Lot ends up getting kidnapped by a, a group of kings that form a coalition. And Abram forms an army with his household servants, which is kind of impressive. You know, he had like three or 400 servants. He forms his own army. He chases these kings down. He beats them in battle. And of course, because he was victorious in battle, he and his men take a, a great deal of, of goods, right? They, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? They, spoils, of spoils of war. Thank you very much. Yeah, they took the spoils of war. Abraham goes past this city of Salem, which would later become Jerusalem, and he meets Melchizedek, who's the high priest of God. And he, after this conflict, he gives Melchizedek a tithe, a tenth. Jacob, I think, is sort of promising something similar. Jacob has already been in conflict. And as we go on to read his story, Jacob's got more conflict in the future. And it's almost as if he's promising God, 
Get me through this time of conflict, and when I get to the end, if I am at peace, I will give you a tenth. So there's another little echo of Abraham that he, he shows his gratitude for God delivering him through conflict by giving him a tenth. All right, we are just about out of time. I'm going to skip a couple slides because I want to get over here to Jesus. And the reason I bring Jesus up, and I, I'm going to skip a little bit of this because I want to get to uh, this right here. So you've got this, um, this story involving Philip and Nathaniel. Philip meets Jesus. He's convinced. He goes and grabs Nathaniel. He brings Nathaniel to Jesus. Jesus uh, convinces Nathaniel that he is the son of God. Nathaniel confesses him in this section. And there toward the end, down here at the very bottom, I want to look at this right here. Jesus says to Nathaniel, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, where have you read something that sounds a lot like that? Well, you read it back in the dream of Jacob, right? What was Jacob's dream? He sees a stairway going up to heaven. He sees the presence of God. He sees heaven open and he sees the presence of God up at the top. And he sees angels going up and down the stairway. Well, what's Jesus teaching us in this passage? Well, Jesus convinces Nathaniel that he is the son of God. He, uh, he does so with one of the most uh, unremarkable miracles in the gospel accounts. Not that miracles are unremarkable. It's just like one of the least remarkable miracles. But this statement, as angels ascending and descending on the son of man, that should take us back to the dream of Jacob. And I think what Jesus is telling us is that he is the stairway to God. He is the bridge between heaven and earth. That if I want to go to the presence of God, how do I get there? I get there through Jesus. What does he say later on in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So Jacob's dream is a bit of a prophecy. It's a prophecy foreseeing that in his seed, in Jesus, mankind would have access to God, that Jesus is the stairway to heaven, if you will. Again, apologies to Led Zeppelin, but that's, that's the imagery that we get back in Jacob's dream. Jacob is the stairway to God. He is how we gain access to the divine, which I think just ties the Old Testament and the New Testament together very nicely once again. So if you've ever wondered what that means there at the end of John chapter 1, that's what I think it probably means. Jesus is telling us he is the fulfillment of that dream of Jacob. All right, I, I'm just about out of time here. I got three minutes. Any questions, comments? Really great discussion tonight. Thanks for bringing those questions. And uh, makes me wonder if uh, maybe my lesson idea maybe had some merit. So <laughs> it would be a very difficult one to put together because uh, uh, it's just a difficult topic to talk about. So. And, and unfortunately, a lot of us just don't have a lot of background in it because our history classes, it, they generally focused on American history, right? We had very, I had very little world history. I had, a, I had one year of world history in high school, and I think that might be a lot in comparison to, to uh, some uh, school districts. Even world history is almost entirely Western Europe. Exactly right. Yeah, you don't hardly ever get over into Asia. Um, yeah. You, you didn't have Dr. Ruth Town. No, I didn't. Did you have world history here in Putnam? No, no. No? Truman. Oh, a Truman, yeah. Yeah, I Yeah, I don't think I even took world history in college. I think I took American history. Just just needed the credit. So, yep. All right, well, we'll take a moment to extend the gospel invitation if anyone's here. Well, I think we're all Christians here tonight. So, uh, I don't know that offering the gospel invitation is necessary, but... It is good to remind one another that we're here to help each other get to heaven. And if 
you need the prayers of the church here, if you need some encouragement, if you just need a helping hand, what, whatever we can do to help you, that's why we're here. Let's stand and sing the number that Darl's got selected. One, uh, 396, 396. <clears throat> Camping toward King's Land. <clears throat> I will leave this land of bondage with its earthly treasures. I'll journey to a place where there is love on every hand. I'll exchange a land of heartache for a land of pleasure. I'm camping, I'm camping for Canaan's happy land. Every day I'm camping for the land of Canaan. And with rapture I'll survey its wondrous beauties grand. Glory, hallelujah, I will find the land of promise. For I'm camping, I'm camping toward Canaan's happy land. Out of Egypt I will travel through the darkness dreary, far over hills and valleys and across the desert sands. But I'll end up safe at home where I shall not grow weary. I'm camping, I'm camping for Canaan's happy land. Every day I'm camping for the land of Canaan. And with rapture I'll survey its wondrous beauty's grand. Glory, hallelujah, find the land of promise. Camping, I'm camping for Canaan's happy land. Yes, I reach the land of promise with its scenes of glory. My journey ending in a place so lovely and so grand. I'll be led by Jesus to that blessed land of story. I'm camping, I'm camping for Canaan's happy land. Every day I'm camping for the land of Canaan, and with rapture I'll survey its wondrous beauties grand. Glory, hallelujah, find the land of promise. I'm camping, I'm camping for Canaan's happy land.